Okay, winery equipment two. Power, crush pads, tanks, and fittings, oh my! Well, let's get going. So the one thing we have to think about when we're getting into winery equipment is what does all of this requ equipment require? So it requires power. So one of the things that I think we frequently don't think about um, when we're you know getting into this industry is just how important electricity is. So we've got to think about the different types of power. And I just kind of want to give you a 10,000 foot overview. I'm not an electrician at all. Um, we'll leave that to some other people that are more capable than me. But I just want to give you a, a quick glancing overview so that when you start specking equipment, you know what to get. So I'm not an electrician, again, just from experience here. Basically what you're used to using and plugging into your house is 110, 120 single phase. This is the most standard. Uh, most countries use 220 volt because it's the most efficient and it's strangely safer. So if you get, electric, if you get electrocuted by 220, um, you'll get burned. But 110, uh, 120, given the hertz that we have is closer to the um, frequency of your heart. So if you get electric, uh, electrocuted by 110, 120, you're more likely to die from it. Um, but then uh, I want to talk about 220, 240 volt single phase. So single phase is basically just two, you know, 120 volt lines stuck together. And um, again, it's easy to get because most services will provide that. Um, but uh, most equipment isn't single phase. Now three phase requires four wires and most important wine equipment and most uh, winery equipment will require this. Um, uh, single phase can be turned in three phase and there are different kinds of phase converters. There used to be motors, but now there's digital phase converters. But why this is important is if you have to bring in three phase power, which one of our uh, local wineries did, you know, you're talking many tens, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 to bring in uh, service. Um, then we also have 440, 480, th three phase. And again, there's even higher voltages than this. The thing is, is that as you kind of go up in voltage, the power becomes cheaper because the power company doesn't have to step it down. So uh, for things that are big power draws like refrigeration, this is where we want to use that big high power, um, high voltage stuff to be able to, to run your, your big power draws. Um, so for like refrigeration and steamers, uh, we use ours. Uh, for a combination of things, uh, our, our big draw stuff in that 480 range is uh, for our forklifts uh, charger and as well as when Signature pulls up uh, with the bottling line, that's what they steam with. So again, just think about it. Uh, just know that when you go buy a piece of equipment, you can't plug it in. Uh, you might want to consult some other people. This isn't, again, a lesson in electrician, you know, being an electrician at all. Uh, it's just to make you understand that you've got to think about what you're going to buy and why you're going to buy it. Um, now I want to just talk quick and dirty. Now, if you're going to have new service come in, um, or upgrade, you're going to have to go through a lot of permitting, um, and think about what you're going to need. Now, say you've got, um, uh, a piece of equipment like, uh, our distiller that runs on 240 volt three phase, and it pulls, uh, 20 amps of current on the startup. Now, say you've got, you know, 20 pieces of equipment that, uh, run on, that have a 20 amp startup draw. So you'd think that you need 400 amps of service in order to be able to turn them on. Well, that's not really true because you're never very, very rarely going to have to turn all of them 20 on at once. Uh, so, you know, just realize you're going to have to to size your uh, system accordingly. So realize, uh, and this is why you hire engineers, and this is why you consult your local power company. But if, if you're going to be buying equipment, make sure you've got enough power coming to your facility to be able to handle that piece of equipment. I know a number of local wineries that decided to go buy steamers and didn't realize how much power they drew. So they went and bought a $6,000 steamer and ended up having to do a $40,000, you know, uh, complete power upgrade to be able to power that $6,000 steamer. So uh, just sort of uh, think about that. And again, all of these uh, requirements are specced on the machinery. There'll be a little metal tag that'll tell you uh, what voltage and what power uh, and, and what the amperage draws are. Uh, again, just make sure that you actually have the ability to power the equipment that you need. Uh, refrigeration, again, um, I'm not an expert. So um, one of the things I want to talk about is in 2012, we used $7,000 worth of refrigeration in 2012 because we had the wrong chiller. Um, so they changed the chillers and they put in another chiller that would have reduced the cost by about tenfold, down to about $700 a year worth of power. The only problem was they put the chiller in the wrong spot. They put it under the canopy. It got so hot, it drew more power because it was put in the wrong spot. 
And it was put in the wrong spot hilariously by our HVAC team uh, that teaches HVAC at the school. And the first page of the owner's manual, when you open it up, it says, do not install under anything. They immediately installed it under something. So after it burned out, um, the new uh, grounds people decided to come in and put a giant chiller in that's going to draw about $20,000 worth of electricity a year to keep our uh, winery cool. And so um, if we would have been smart about this um, and just bought the chiller we needed, uh, we could have uh, been, been very efficient. So right now, uh, our winery needs about three to four tons of chilling capacity. What that means to you is, is literally nothing. But uh, we now have a 40-ton chiller that's running to keep our three-ton winery uh, cool. So if you are going to spec your chiller, make sure that you get the right size. Uh, it will save you a lot of money in the long run. So when you're sizing your chillers, multiple small chillers are preferable to one big ones. Um, you can shut down small units when peak demand is not needed. And then you also have redundancy. The last thing you want to do in a hot summer when you've got ripping ferments is have only one chiller and have it go down. Um, and then one more thing to think about is all of these uh, chillers, the way that they work is they make a refrigerated cool solution and that pumps through the jackets on the tank. So if you notice when you're walking around the cellar, there's little dimpled jackets on all of the tanks. And that's where we run basically cold water through them. But the, the water gets so cold, it's going to get down below 30 degrees. And then in the wintertime, uh, when it gets really cold out, maybe to those, you know, negative, uh, you know, zero to, you know, kind of around zero degrees, those um, mixtures uh, can't freeze. So we had uh, inhibited uh, glycol, which is food grade glycol. And um, in order for you to check that percentage of how much glycol you have, basically you do it just with a hydrometer. Um, and again, this isn't going to be something we're going to examine over. I don't want to talk about it too much. Again, just glancing over the idea that you need to have something in there other than water to keep it from, from freezing up in the wintertime. And that way you can get your tanks down to, you know, maybe 28 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, negative uh, one or two degrees centigrade to, to be able to cold stabilize your wine. So um, you've just got to have something mixed in there other than uh, water and using food grade inhibited glycol is what you need to do. So just, again, 10,000 foot view. So I want to talk about crush pad design. This is what you'd like to see in a small winery. Uh, something where we have a, a shaker table to sort, uh, then an elevator to a distimmer, then another sorter table, and then an elevator maybe to a tank or maybe a must pump or something like that. So this is a, a pretty simple crush pad design that, that most of us that are going to work in small wineries are pretty familiar with. But on the other hand, and here you have a small family winery. So I want you to take a look at this uh, picture for a second. So if you look down to the bottom sort of left hand side of the screen, notice those are cars. Yeah, those are cars. And just to the next of those cars, each of those tanks holds a million gallons. This is the largest winery in the world. This is Gallo's Livingston facility. And um, I have toured it. It's pretty fascinating. So if you look at that U-shaped driveway right there, this is where the trucks come in and go. And those are that's directly to the left kind of center side. And if you see those big kind of, not big, they're just sort of like, look like black cockroaches to the left. Those are actually semi-gondola trailers. And those hold 20 tons apiece. And so as the trucks pull in, uh, they come around this U-shaped turn, and then they have cranes that tip the, the trucks to the sides. They don't have to back up and dump. And they can receive something along the lines of, I want to say it's like 20,000 tons a day. Um, and so each of those uh, places where you, you see where the, the, the dumping is going, if you look directly to the right of where that U-shaped sort of driveway is, you see a bunch of things that look like you know, tin cans on their side. Those are um, presses that hold 100 tons each. That's right. So four truckloads into each press, and then they can press them. And they've got, I think, about 20 presses that are constantly running um, all during vintage in order to fill these, um, uh, these, uh, these, these gondolas. When I first visited there, they actually had all um, uh, continuous presses, and the trucks would circle through the driveway, they would circle down below, and then there was direct output and they would take the grape skins back to the vineyards. Uh, pretty fascinating operation. So um, a very different uh, style of, uh, of manufacturing than the small uh, vineyards and wineries that you are, are you know, used to working at. And this is a uh, close-up view that I took when I was there of that uh, crush pad. So to give you an idea of the scope and size and scale uh, that some some other wineries work at. So again, that idea of throughput and what type of equipment do you need is all going to be very different based on where you work. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about different types of distimmers. And so if you kind of look to the left, um, what we have here is our uh, mechanical harvester. And this is how about 80% of all fruit in America is, is picked. Now, the one that you're looking at here is a Polonk, and these are the new distimmers that are pretty amazing. They distim, and they also discard all the stems in the vineyard, and they just deliver whole fruit. This is the future of wine, and because of that, um, you're going to see distimmers and crushers and things like that on crush pads start to diminish because hand picking is going to be a lot harder. Um, as we have reduced uh, labor uh, and people that are willing to do the labor, hand picking is going to diminish. And... If uh, what we'll actually do is we're going to talk about uh, a trial that we did in 2018 uh, where we did the, the plonk versus our distimmer crusher and a crusher distimmer. And so these things are all important, too. So if you're going to get all machine harvested fruit that's done like this, you don't need one of these. You don't need a distimmer crusher or a crusher distimmer. These are 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar pieces of equipment that are becoming rendered obsolete by machine harvesters because these machine harvesters have them built in. But then if you move to the, the right in that center picture, you know our distimmer crusher. And what that does is it distims and then maybe crushes a fruit or not, depending on whether we have crusher rollers in it. So the fruit goes in the top, gets distimmed, and then comes out the bottom. And then to the right uh, is a crusher distimmer. And this is sort of the original way that we did things. And what it does is it has the crusher rollers in the top, crushes the fruit, then it distims. Uh, and we get a lot more stims in, in, in that type of uh machine. So the point point here is, is that we have mechanical harvesting, we have distimmers, and then we have crusher distimmers. And these are the primary ways that we uh, bring our fruit onto the crush pad and then process it through. I want to talk real quick about presses. Um, so let's go with baskets real quick. Basket presses advantages are they're really slow, they're really gentle, um, and they're really cool looking. Uh, that's about where the advantages end. The disadvantages are they are slow. Um, for pressing white wine, you could press in that big, beautiful booker, you could press four tons in about eight hours. Um, so very slow. Um, also very low extract. They're not particularly good at getting a lot of juice out. So really low juice yields, just really not the best uh, in terms of... of uh, you know, throughput. However, for quality purposes, for red wine, probably hard to beat because they just don't beat up the, the fruit as much. It's just a very gentle, slow process. Bladder presses, which you're all very familiar with, we have one of those. Um, the advantages to them is they're uh, super powerful. You can press the guts out of the wine. Um, so they're probably the most powerful of all the presses. Uh, you can put more pressure on them than anything else. They're designed to crash uh, cranberries as well as grapes. So very strong, that's the upside. The disadvantages are they are a rubber bladder and they will pop in the middle of vintage, which is normal. Uh, the other disadvantages to them is they're pretty old school. There aren't a lot, there's no safety equipment on them. And uh, they're also totally manual. They're very analog. So in this digital age, you've got to have an operator that stands there all day and turns it on and off. And that's a pretty expensive proposition, paying somebody by the hour to stand there and monitor one of those. And again, disadvantages in this modern day and age, something that is that archaic and you know lack of safety uh, is pretty terrifying uh, to have on your crush pad. So let's also talk about membrane presses. This is pretty much the gold standard. Uh, this is the same as our booker that we have at our crush pad. The only difference is uh, this is one that I worked on in New Zealand, and this holds uh, 50 tons of fruit. So whereas our distemmer, or our little press, we can cram in about, you know, maybe two and a half tons. Um, this is about 20 times bigger. Uh, it's as big as me standing up and down. Uh, and this particular winery we worked out had 12 of them, and we could receive about 1,400 tons a day. Um, the advantages to uh, membrane presses is that since they press from the side, uh, you can only put that giant press could press one ton of fruit perfectly just fine. So it doesn't need to have a certain load. Um, the disadvantages to them is that they're computer programmed. So you're going to get what you're going to get. You know, you don't have that analog ability like you do with the bladder press to get to press just as much as you want until you get the flavor profile you want. Um, so that's one of the downsides to them. Um, but the upside is, is that you fill them, you press start and you walk away. Um, and the other disadvantage is because it's a fill and empty, like all of the other presses, the, the bladder and the, the um, uh, basket press, you've got to fill it up, you've got to press, and then you've got to empty the pomace. So that is a fairly slow process. I mean, we're talking two, three, four hours to do a press load. 
Now, screw presses, which is to the right, um, these are typically used for Concord juice extraction. A lot of times they'll heat up the Concord juice, you know, grapes, and then they hot press them. So the advantages to these are is they're direct throughput. You put the fruit in, and the juice comes out the bottom, skins come out the side. They are the fastest, they are the most efficient, and they are the highest yielding of all of them. Disadvantages are they really press the guts out of the fruit. And they were really thought of as pretty negative for overall quality. However, um, with the adventation of uh, flotation, these are making their way back into fad because you can take all that phenolic material that you got and junk you got, all the tannins and everything else you get from just crushing the guts out of a fruit, and you can remove it in the flotation process. So you can increase your, your pressing speed pretty much infinitely over uh, these other types. And then you can clean up the juice afterwards. So uh, something that was basically a dead technology all of five years ago is making a comeback. So pretty cool. Now let's talk about uh, tank shapes. Um, so they all matter. Um, tank shapes matter. And we'll get more into this in question and answer period. But short and fat tanks are generally for red wine fermentation, maybe for white juice settling And so the real limitations to these is that when they're short and fat, you're going to spread the cap out and you'll get better, you know, general phenolic extraction. It's easier to manipulate the cap. So um, that's sort of the idea. These are generally red wine tanks or, you know, for fermentation or for holding wine once it's finished. Now, tall and narrow tanks um, are really not so great for red wine. Um, they have an upside that they really retain a lot of ferment, aromatics, and esters. So tall, narrow tanks are really good for aromatic whites. They really retain all that because there's very little space for all that stuff to leave. Um, the downside to tall, narrow tanks is, is that all things being equal, that fatty tank to the left versus a tall, narrow tank to the right, if you did everything the same, the kind of fatter tank, especially if it was open top, would have 1% alcohol less than the tall, narrow tank. And that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, namely, the, the tall, narrow tanks are a little bit more difficult environment for yeast to ferment, and when they're stressed, they make more alcohol. And the other thing that sort of happens is, is because there's no place for it to leave, um, you uh, the ethanol to leave out the top, uh, you will actually retain some. So uh, there's advantages and disadvantages, and also realize that the smaller and taller and narrow your tank is, the more expensive per square foot it's going to be. It requires a lot more material, so they become a lot more expensive. So tanks, there's so many different kinds. So closed top, the advantages to that is they're closed, they're sealed. The downside to closed top tanks is that if you have a closed top and you want to store wine in it, you have to make sure that tank is 100% full or you've got to gas it basically every day with an inert gas. If not, those wines will go bad. So that type of a tank you want to size really accurately. Um, open top tanks are great for fermentation, but that's all they're good for. Because after you ferment, if they're completely open top, there's nothing you can do about it. So after your fermentation, those, those tanks are very uh, short-lived and they are only used during harvest. Variable capacity is basically an open top with a floating lid. Um, the upside to those is, is that you can uh, you know put any volume of wine in them and then you can set the lid on it and seal it. The downside to variable capacity uh, tanks is that those gaskets fail and then they leak and then you get bugs in it or those gaskets uh the wine expands and squirts up over the top the next thing you have mold and rot and then i have never seen a winery where the gasket is completely immaculately clean all the way around so um they're very difficult to keep clean other things to think about is that with those closed top open top variable capacity you can either have conical bottoms or slope bottoms and those can uh, have advantages and disadvantages for, for emptying. So things I'd like to discuss in our Zoom meeting, uh, we can talk about all the, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, other things that are important are uh, materials. So stainless steel, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. Not all stainless is created equally. Um, and then we also have concrete and concrete's very in vogue right now. It's very popular. It was very in vogue 200 years ago when that was the best material we had. But one of the things I find amazing about the human uh, capacity is its uh, capacity to forget. And so we've seemed to have forgotten how bad concrete was. So we brought it back um, and it'll stick around for a while until people realize how bad it is again. And then they'll epoxy it all closed like they have in every winery in France because you can't really clean it. But um, it does have some advantages uh, because 
in 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 wineries the the stainless steel has its disadvantages because it's very slippery nothing fun for the yeast to sit on whereas concrete does provide a better environment for fermentation kinetics so you know from a fermentation standpoint if you like yeast if you like microflora concrete's really good and then wood has its advantages too we'll talk about oak and oak chemistry but wood is much like concrete it gets infected and it's really difficult to keep clean uh, but the upside to wood is that there's, we, as we've learned uh, over time, and again, we'll talk about this more, uh, wood actually does have compounds that integrate into red wine to help uh, stand in tannin stability, uh, flavor, and structure of wine. So there are things that it actually contributes. But again, wood is a very limited lifespan. Uh, if you have a fermenter, you'd be lucky to get five, six uh, vintages out of it before you start to have some things grow in it that you, you really don't want. So... Again, I want to talk about stainless steel real quick. It's all the same, right? Well, no, it's not. There are a lot of different kinds. Um, and so uh, this is just kind of taken straight out of uh, Wikipedia, which is, I know, terrible. But uh, there is a lot of different types of stainless out there. So there are three types for wine industry usage, and some people cheat. Uh, not all stainless is created equally, and you need to be able to get it checked. So uh, 304 is the most common type of stainless steel in the wine industry. Make sure that it is at least that. Um, 316L is a little bit better, and this is the high-grade stuff. You walk down in our cellar, you'll see 304 with our Latina tanks. We do have one tank that's 316L. It's Spokane Industries. It's our tank four, which is uh, my favorite tank, but it's really expensive. The difference between those two tanks, uh, we have a, if you were to go to tank three, which is a thousand liter, uh, you know, 304 tank, that was $3,000. The 316L tank that we have, which will last forever, uh, was about $11,000. So you're looking at about three to four times more expensive. Um, and then 303 stainless is the same as 304, but it's treated a little differently to assure mean, uh, machinability. So this is for your valves and fittings, et cetera. So be sure that metal is SAE uh, certified or AS, uh, AISI certified American uh, Iron and Steel Institute, uh, because if not, you will get tanks that rust. And I have seen that before. People got these beautiful tanks that were off brand. And the next thing you know, they are all rusty and all that iron is going into your wine, which is going to cause terrible things to happen later on down the road. Real quick, valves and fittings. Um, this is the most important thing you will learn in this in you know in this lecture. If anything else, valves and fittings. Um, I worked at a winery locally that uh, when I brought was brought to town that bought uh, the old Waterbrook facility, and they had bought they bought the building. Uh, they didn't buy the building. They bought the tanks and they bought the big equipment. But what they didn't do is look in all these bins. There was all these bins and the guy that bought everything was a billionaire. And, you know, he didn't think twice about uh, all the small things. He was looking at the big shiny stuff. So he bought the big tanks. And in the meantime, the smart buyers at this auction bought all of the harvest bins full of valves and fittings. And when I started working at the old Waterbrook facility, I said, hey, we got to buy valves and, and things like that. And he said, OK, go buy valves. And so I bought valves for his big shiny tanks and the bill was $40,000 for enough valves and fittings to put the tanks together. So um, I just think that it's one of those things that adds up really, really quick. I'm going to go through it really fast. Um, right now, if you were to add up all the valves and fitting we have just in the cellar, you'd be over $8,000 for just what we have downstairs. So um, that is pretty bonkers. So I want to think about valve pricing. So this is, uh, you know, buying the really expensive uh, Defnox uh, valves from Central Industrial Sales. Uh, you can buy a four inch ball valve or a butterfly valve for $400. So the ball valve that we have on the back of our um, uh, membrane press, uh, that was an $800 valve. Uh, so give you an idea that these things add up really, really quickly. And when you need to have, you know, 40 or 50 of these, this can really be a shocker to people. Um, and then on the other side, uh, you can go to St. Pat's of Texas and buy that same four inch valve for $130. But what I will encourage you to do, if you have time, is look up St. Pat's of Texas and look up their Yelp reviews. It is hilarious. Maybe there's a reason they're so cheap. Um, real quick talk about valves. Uh, butterfly valves are what you're most used to seeing. Butterfly valves are really great for pumping wine. But if you take a look at that butterfly valve and you try to pump must through that, I think you can see where there's a problem. You can get stems hung up. You can get all sorts of things hung up. So uh, butterfly valves are a problem because you can't pump straight through them. 
Um, but when you seal them, the sealed edge is very small. It's a very singular line on a rubber um, uh, gasket. Whereas if you go to the ball valve, when you open a ball valve, you get to see straight through it. That's the upside. The downside to a ball valve is a few things. Number one, when that valve is closed sideways, it still has wine in it. So if you're fermenting, you cannot just close the valve or they'll build enough pressure during a fermentation, you'll blow the valve up and then you dump your whole tank on the ground. Um, so whenever you're using a ball valve, you can pump into the tank, you can close it, and then you have to cap off that ball valve and open it back up at night. Um, and then also ball valves are a nightmare to keep clean because that ball, when it rotates to the side, you can never get it totally clean. It always traps stuff in it. It's a big pain. So again, this is that idea of butterfly valves, no extra thing required, but let me explain to you a couple things. There's always hot spots um, in those gaskets and junctions. You've got to take them apart every year and clean them out. Um, and you just got to rebuild them. It's just part of the nature of the beast. It's just part of running a winery every year. All the valves come down, they all come out, they all get taken down, they all get broken down, they all get cleaned up and they all get put back together. If you need to replace gaskets, you do. Same with ball valves, same thing. You need a cover to leave them open. Again, there's these hot spots and gaskets and stainless junctions. You gotta stay on top of them and they've gotta be rebuilt regularly. Against once a year, they've gotta come all the way apart and make sure that they're totally cleaned out. I wanna talk about different types of fittings. Uh, RJT, sorry for this, I'll change it in the PDF. Uh, it looks like it's coming up funny in the YouTube video. Um, RJT stands for ring joint type. And uh, these you'll see in, um, uh, Australia frequently and overseas. And then we use triclover fittings. Uh, and it was really interesting to me to go travel around the world and realize that almost no one else uses triclover fittings. It's a fairly American thing to do. Um, I'll talk about RJT fittings. These are really widely used. They're super easy to connect. You just whack them on and thread them into place. They're super durable and they're really good for big connections. Uh, they're much easier to put together. Putting together a three or four inch uh, triclover fitting by yourself is quite a feat. Uh, whereas an RJT is much easier. Uh, the downside to RJT fittings is you can spin them, you can cross the threads, uh, which means they're getting worn out regularly. Gaskets don't really come out and they're not commonly clean, so they're a little bit dirtier. So they're just not as sanitary as a triclover fitting, which is why the dairy industry primarily uses triclover fittings on their, their equipment. Um, so triclovers, again, these are widely used. They're easy to sanitize. There's no, none of that risk of you know, spun threads. The gasket inspection is really easy. You can take a look at the gasket and make sure it's really clean. And they work really well on smaller hoses. Uh, the downside is they're cumbersome um, and the ferrules on them, which is that edge, when people slam them on the ground, they dent. And when they dent, uh, you can't seal them really well and they can leak really easily. Um, so the clamps aren't terribly durable either and they tend to break. So uh, there is no perfect uh, solution, but those are the two most common type in the wine industry. All right. Then we're, we're getting close. We're almost there, boys and girls. Um, so three basic types. So um, the, the Coniflex, which is the most common that you're probably used to seeing in our cellar, uh, it's uh, common, it's inexpensive, it's easy to use, and uh, the suction, it can pull suction and it can handle modest pressure. So if you look at those ones, those are the clear ones in the, the middle of that picture. I'd like to point out that is vintage in New Zealand, and that is a setup I had to navigate uh, every day. Uh, we call it the hose pile, and it's where all the manifolds met. And those hoses are four inches in diameter, uh, much bigger than anything we have at the school. You're used to seeing three-inch hoses. Those, that's the big one that we pump muster. These are four inches. Um, there's one three-inch hose. That's the blue one running through the middle. And you can just see how minuscule what our must pump hose looks like in relationship to uh, a winery that's you know processing 30,000 metric tons during vintage. Um, so Coniflex, pretty, uh, pretty standard. They're pretty inexpensive, but they crack real easily. They wear out easy. And if you leave them out in the sun, they, they tend to wear out pretty fast. But the upside is, is that you can, uh, you know, suck with them and they also can handle uh, modest pressure. Uh, the flexible opaque, which would be like the red ones running through the middle. Uh, uh, they, they, no, actually the blue ones running through the middle. Sorry about that. Uh, the blue ones, you can see how they're already kinked. Um, they kink really easily. They've got to be in a straight line and they're for pressure only. So they're fairly inexpensive. The ultimate hose are the pressure opaque. And we have some of these at the winery now. The only reason we use them for is 
bottling. And the downside to opaque is you can't see through them. You can't tell if they're clean. Whereas Conaflex, you can kind of tell if there's some mold or junk growing. And I think if you look at the middle hose running through the middle, the you know, middle with the red and blue on it, kind of going straight back, you can see some mold and things growing on that one. And you know that hose probably needs to be clean from the inside out. Whereas you wouldn't be able to see that in that opaque hose. But um, to give you an idea, that red one red hose running through the middle of the screen from the front to the back, that's probably a five to seven thousand dollar hose that's right five to seven thousand dollar hose the picture you are looking at probably has fifty to seventy five thousand dollars worth of hoses in it so um, another commonly overlooked expense in the wine industry is just how expensive hoses and fittings and all the little things are so when you're putting a project together and you're starting to think about what you need, or more importantly, when you're working at a winery this harvest, think about the expense of all of the equipment you're working with and why you need to treat it gently and thoughtfully. So quick review, know your power requirements before buying equipment. Um, type of fruit processing equipment has an impact not only on throughput, but also on quality. Um, Sizing uh, presses, sizing everything is important for throughput. Just knowing where your bottlenecks is going to be and think through it. Um, don't forget the fittings. Last thing, not all hoses are created equally. You've got to have the right shape and the right size for your needs. Now on to pumps. Part three.